24-year-old male with a broken femur. It's a pretty accomplished group of snowmobilers. They're all locals. I see that his quadricep is the size of a soccer ball, and he didn't want to move. We needed to get him warm, get his leg splinted, and go. We don't know if the helicopter can make it back, yep. and we don't know so. what time they're getting back. So we just have to sort of be self-sufficient yeah. for now. Yeah. So okay. we need all hands on deck here, people. One, two, three. Easy, 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 easy. Jackson Hole, Wyoming might be known as the gateway to Yellowstone, but many come to hunt and fish outside the park. For local hunters and anglers, it's an all-season paradise where the exact location of the best trout holes and elk haunts remain well-kept secrets. For most of its more than 200-year history, Jackson Hole was a remote outpost where hunters and anglers were on their own. If anyone got lost or in trouble in the backcountry, Rescue work fell to local outfitters who hauled people back to town on horseback. Now, there's Teton County's search and rescue. And when a hunter or anyone else goes missing, the team uses helicopters to search by air. They bring along specialists in backcountry emergency medicine, doctors like A.J. Wheeler, who are on a mission to extend hospital care to every corner of Teton County. I have a lot of irons in the fire. I mean, one of my goals is to elevate our level of medical care that we're providing across the county, whether it's in the Grand Teton National Park and the National Forest or on our search and rescue missions. It's an ambitious goal that puts incredible demands on Dr. Wheeler's time. Once we get you over there, we can get your legs stabilized and you feel a lot better. In addition to living on call, waiting for accidents to happen, AJ is also the father of two young kids. Sometimes just uh, little reminders about the things that are important to your family. He'd rather be fly fishing with his son than flying out the door on another rescue call. What's this called, like an elk hair or something? It's an elk hair caddis, yep. My first elk. We are keep it on the down low that we are able to go there. Between bison and elk, I think we're set for a little while. I love my search and rescue team, but my family is my foundation, and the kids think you know, this is special. I don't think they realize exactly what I do on the team, but I think they know it's not something that everybody does. What is your job? Just tell them what you think I do. Um, I think he helps them find the people when they're hurt, who need help. Yeah, I think so. This is one of my getaways. My office is the one room in the house that's mine. That's every night here. I designed the house to have this view. <laughs> so uh, there's not a bad view in the house. It just reminds you why we live here, why we get to do what we do. The pass right there, Mount Glory's in the clouds, and the south side of the pass where a lot of people ski, sitting right there. So a lot of times we get that call, I can look right out the window and see what the weather is like on the pass right where we're heading. You got to be ready for everything. I think I view the world in my own special way, but I think if you want to see the world a certain way, you have to go out and make it that way. And for me, putting those irons in the fire and trying to corral the family and work with these different agencies is my attempt to put my stamp on the world and get things to work the way I think they should. It's a small community. We get out there and people get after it. 
And unfortunately, accidents happen. That's why donors and volunteers came together to build Teton County Search and Rescue, the best equipped facility in the Rockies. The queen of this hangar is Jess King. Today, she's getting ropes and rigging gear ready for a practice run up on Teton Pass. These are the tools that allow the team to cling to mountainsides and pull people out of danger, but not without hours and hours of training. You need to have a higher skill level. You need to have really good partners that you trust. The volunteer in charge of building that trust is training director Jake Urban. This year, he's joined by his wife, Marilyn Davis, now a rookie paramedic on the team. Jake and I work well together, and we're hoping to sort of take it to the next level. Jake is great. He has got so much energy for this team. He loves it. So the tension will be on your prussics, and it will be backed up. He shows up for everything on time. He stays late. He puts an enormous amount of energy into his training program. He's a lifer. I'm hurting 40-some members, and once we've got the structure in place, training is the most fun I have with the team. Today's mission? To practice ropes rigging for lowering injury victims off steep mountain slopes. They'll load the heli and head for Teton Pass, where it's easy to simulate a real backcountry emergency. After insertion, we are moving up the ridge as teams in order to get to the training location. We're gonna package a patient and then lower the patient through the terrain, do a knot pass, and receive that patient so that we can do a second lower in that terrain. Your two anchors are gonna to go to one focal point. Our two anchors are gonna to go to one focal point. We'll have a rope on each one that will each go to the system. Rigging is the foundation of everything that we do in search and rescue. It's the foundation of teamwork. It's the foundation of technical skill. Clips are good, and your knot looks good. Volunteer Cody Lockhart ropes up before moving out to a cliff area where rescues are common. We're getting ready to lower off this face here, and we're using skis to make anchors. And basically, we dig a trench, put the skis in that trench, and then the skis with the snow is strong enough to hold a large load. I used to play doctor, now I'm playing a patient. We're just finishing up with the lowering activities for the day, and we're moving into working on some snow shelters when I'm getting a board page. A board page is the initial emergency call that goes out to all the search and rescue board members. 24-year-old male with a broken femur. It's a pretty accomplished group of snowmobilers. They're all locals. And it's Dr. A.J. Wheeler's signal to race to the hangar and take over as incident commander. Hey, this is Dr. Wheeler from Search and Rescue. Good, thanks. His busy schedule kept him out of training today, but he'll assist by overseeing the team's response to this call out. Without Dr. Wheeler on the scene, the team is counting on Jake and his paramedic wife, Marilyn, to take the medical lead on a potentially lethal femur fracture. The broken bones can nick any of the arteries or veins. It was a bad injury. It's a tough working condition when someone's in that kind of pain. Teton County search and rescue training is interrupted by the real thing when a call for help comes in while most of the team is 12 miles away from the hangar up on Teton Pass. So the heli is dispatched to pick up medical first responders who rush to the scene. We just got a call out for an injured snowmobiler down in the Fall Creek area. We believe he or she has a broken femur at this point. The weather's moving in, but it's looking pretty good south. So the plan right now is AJ as I see Hey, this is Dr. Wheeler from Search and Rescue. As incident commander, AJ will oversee the medical team working in the field. Unfortunately, communications get off to a rocky start. There's always confusion at the beginning of a SAR call. We have very little good information. All AJ knows is there's an injured snowmobiler whose life may depend on a quick helicopter evacuation. But now, bursts of wind and snow create sketchy flying conditions. It's not looking good, but we'll see. We've flown in worse, I'll just put it that way. AJ is one of the team's best backcountry doctors, but he can't make it into the field for this one. So AJ makes sure Jake and the heli team are ready to answer this call. Do you have any medical people with you? Yes, I do. I have, I have a paramedic. Great, thank you. 
Make sure they're in that first group. Okay. Copy. That means volunteer paramedic Marilyn Davis is officially on her first call as the team's medical lead, with Jake and Anthony there to help. I'm a brand new paramedic, one year in, just came off probation a month ago. We're flying overhead. It's a bumpy flight, so I was already nervous. Anthony and I got dropped off. Jake went back to reconfigure the helicopter. Jake's job is to fly to the hangar, pull out the seats, and transform the heli into an airborne ambulance where the patient can be transported lying down. But the upper elevation winds are picking up, so there's no guarantee the heli will be able to make it back to the scene where Marilyn takes command. We approach, we say hi. I ask him his name and what's going on, and he says, my leg is broken. And I see that his quadricep is the size of a soccer ball and he didn't want to move. He's been lying in the snow, so hypothermia is a real concern, and also pain management. For quick pain relief, Marilyn doses the patient through his nostrils. Then she focuses on the man's dropping body temperature. He had been sitting on the snow for maybe 45 minutes, and it was inconclusive whether the helicopter was going to be able to make it back. Getting him warmer immediately was the crux of the situation. Marilyn and Anthony need to move the patient off the snow and into a position that stabilizes his leg. It was very clear what we needed to do. We needed to get him warm, get his leg splinted, and go. It's difficult to decide how to move him, because at this time, Marilyn and Anthony don't know exactly how the man's leg is broken. There's many different ways to have a break. This individual had a spiral fracture so not only did it break in a corkscrew around the femur bone, but then the head of the femur jammed itself and split the lower femur. Just the breaking of the bone, we expect folks to lose a liter of blood, and that's just enough to start putting people into shock. So the injury is bad enough, but you put shock on top of that, throw a little bit of cold and hypothermia into it, and you have a patient that's decompensating pretty quickly. Back at the hangar, the team helps Jake reconfigure the heli with a stretcher, or litter as it's known in the backcountry. But high winds continue to whip the mountains outside of Jackson and create dangerous flying conditions. It was a dicey ride in on the helicopter, so we didn't know if we were going to sit there and wait for a toboggan to come in on the snow machine or if the helicopter was coming back immediately. We don't know if the helicopter can make it back, yeah. and we don't know so, what time they're getting back. So we just have to sort of be self-sufficient yeah. for now. Teton County Search and Rescue rookie paramedic Marilyn Davis needs to keep cool on her first mission as medical lead. We don't know if the helicopter can make it back, yeah. and we don't know so, what time they're getting back. So we just have to sort of be self-sufficient yeah. for now. Yeah. So we need all hands on deck here, people. Marilyn can't wait for the helicopter. It's time to move the patient off the snow. Okay. Is Ready? It, on, yeah, make sure you get a good on. grip. Easy, 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 easy. Nice work. Yeah, nice. nice work, dude. Yeah, there yeah, you yeah. go. Perfect. Good work. Good job. Can you tell us uh, if either of us touch anything that hurt, you let us know. Now it's up to the heli to get back to the rescue scene. Initially sounds dicey to navigate. But the search and rescue heli team decides to brave the dangerous flying conditions so an injured backcountry snowmobiler can get to the emergency room as quickly as possible. Once I arrived back on scene, it was all hands on deck in order to move this patient. Is anyone not ready? I'm ready. Sean, three cars. One, two, three, up. These are the times when, as a search and rescue member, ultimately we kind of just sit back and organize a little bit. We let the civilians do the work, and that's really when it's powerful to see them doing the job. I know the boy's father, 
So I knew that I had helped a friend of mine's child. So that was cool. He was hanging in there and was talking and was super thankful. You know, we got him out quick, and I think the patient felt safe. I'm feeling really good about this scene. It's interesting, I've got two new members, one of which is my wife. We're still trying to figure out how we work together on the team. And it was kind of a perfect situation because it gives me an opportunity to focus on operations and the logistics of getting the patient out. It gives Marilyn an opportunity to step into a leadership role. Great job, everyone, and Marilyn, nice work to elevate the level of care that we're providing in the backcountry. There's been a big goal, and I think we're there. Wind speeds in the Tetons can hit Category 1 hurricane levels throughout the winter. This does more than create treacherous flying conditions for the heli. It also causes the snow to shift in hazardous ways. The more wind, the more dangers caused by snow loading over steep alpine features. One of the most lethal is a cornice. Ultimately, with cornice development, you have snow that builds up incrementally at such a slow rate that it's able to overhang the edge of the cliff. That overhanging feature breaks off and turns into a trap door. It's not a place we want to be hanging out. I have very limited information on this. They state there's one person about to fall off the cornice and they're requesting short haul assistance. Sounds like they were swept off. The they may be on the cliff, they may also be under the cliff buried in debris. They're not sure yet. The details of this emergency call out are eerily similar to an incident just last winter. We had a carbon copy rescue where an individual ducked the rope, stepped out over to the cornice, didn't realize that he was on an overhanging feature, and that feature broke. The guy basically fell off a 200-foot cliff and was alive. He had some injuries, but he walked, and it was one of those things you looked at the 200-foot cliff, and you're like, there's no way that you could fall off of that and live, let alone walk away, and that's exactly what happened. Knowing that somebody has survived, Maybe this is another chance to actually rescue somebody. Teton County Search and Rescue's heli team responds to a call from help from Grand Targhee Ski Area, where a man has reportedly fallen through a cornice and tumbled down a 200-foot cliff. A man's life is on the line. So AJ pushes himself and his teammates to deliver fast care in the backcountry. I got a little hairy. Good job. These are the moments the medical team trains for when the odds appear stacked against the patient. He's not breathing. Don't have a heart rate. We're trying to resuscitate them, trying to perform these life-saving measures. Everybody always wants to be on a rescue and not a recovery. AJ has seen someone survive this fall before and fights hard to see it again. But he also knows there's no guarantee of a happy ending. This time, the patient does not make it. He suffers severe blunt trauma to the head and torso and cannot be revived. We try to keep perspective. For us, the focus becomes not necessarily bringing that victim home alive, but we still have a job to do to bring them back to their loved ones and hopefully provide some comfort. It's never easy to be involved in a death. Being on this team, you see the people that die in the mountains. You see friends that die in the mountains. It's disturbing sometimes. Pretty lucky to have a team that's focused on our team members. We're like an extended family. And so when we respond to a mission that winds up being a death and a body recovery, we'll have a formal debriefing session where we'll sit down and talk about particularly difficult cases. And occasionally, people just need a break from things. All through high school and college, I was a runner. 
given the busy lives that we have, being able to get out on the trail and just zone out and be together with your own thoughts is a great feeling. Kind of solace for the soul. My wife and my kids they don't seem to think twice when I walk out the door because it's assumed that you're going to come back. And some of the stuff we do is risky. And death is always difficult to deal with, but I don't feel like our team views it as a failure. I think emotionally, the team probably feels more sadness 